Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fifth season, we are looking at Joe Johnston's 2011 film, Captain America, The First Avenger. I'm Andy Nelson from the Next Real Film Podcast. And I beat right, and I just follow Andy around. <laughs> Today we are talking about Minute 6, which begins with Schmidt's big reveal and ends with the Tesseract's big reveal. Joining us on the show today and all week, we have Curtis Findlay from the Epic Marvel Podcast. Hi, Curtis. Hello, hello. I'm super happy to be here. It's been a long time coming, Curtis. I know. We are thrilled. that We've been trying <laughs> yeah. to get you on the show for a few seasons now, so we're glad to finally get you. Yeah, I'm, and I'm glad to be here, too. Let's uh, start off. What is, what is the Epic Marvel Podcast? Tell us a little bit about your show. Well, I am a huge fan of comics. I grew up on Marvel Comics, and uh, my I, Marvel currently has a line of trade paperback reprints that they do. They call it the Epic Collection, where they reprint like all of their old stuff from the 1960s through the 90s, and they have a whole bunch of different lines focusing on different characters. And I love these books because I have been diving into Marvel history, a lot of it that I haven't read just because I haven't had access to it. So I decided to do a podcast as I go, as I go along my reading journey. So I'll pick up one volume and it's like, you know, one episode is a chunk of Fantastic Four from 1970s. And then another one is Amazing Spider-Man from the 80s. And then another is Captain America from the 60s. You know, it just jumps all over the place. But I just love reading this old stuff and uh, learning more about the history, talking to creators and talking to fans about it, too. Has there been much of a chance to dip into Captain America as you've been exploring those? Oh yeah, if you go if you go to my website um, epicmarvelpodcast.com you'll see a few episodes of the very early years when Captain America was uh, sharing a comic book with Iron Man called Tales of Suspense. And so uh, I have a bunch of those early episodes covering those early issues and then a uh, one episode in the 80s as well. And that's as far as I have for uh, Captain America at this time, but I hope to be revisiting that sometime soon. Excellent, excellent. Well, in all of that, so so here in this minute, this minute starts off with the reveal. We finally get a chance to see Hugo Weaving playing Johann Schmidt um, with his fantastically Schwarzenegger-ish sort of accent. I love his accent in this film. It's just great. Um, what's your history with this particular character? Have you do you, has there been much Red Skull in the stories that uh, that you had read? Oh, absolutely. Red Skull is there from nearly the beginning. Uh, of course, Red Skull is a character who has a long history with Marvel, uh, going way back to even before Marvel was called Marvel. And I don't know how much of Captain America's history you've already talked about on uh, in your previous episodes, but Captain America and Red Skull are some of the first, the earliest Marvel characters. And so the stuff that I've read is the 60s when Stan Lee decided to bring that character out of retirement and like the publishing company just hadn't used him for a number of years and bring him back and place him in a contemporary setting. And Red Skull followed quickly soon after that. So yeah, I've read a bunch of these old Red Skull issues. A lot of those early stories in the 60s were told as flashbacks in World War II. So we see him in World War II. And then once he joins the modern era, uh, he appears right there with the Cosmic Cube. Like, it's a big thing. Cosmic Cube is a very big thing in kind of the Marvel comics, this <laughs> idea of yes. this cube that does amazing things. And in that particular, I think it's a three-issue thing, um, he gets the Cosmic Cube and it he, it allows him to basically kind of command whatever. And he I just love Red Skull in that it's like a big golden suit of royal armor or something. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's very ambiguous in terms of the powers. I don't know if we're going to jump ahead talking about the cube right now, or do you want to wait till we get through this minute? We'll wait a little bit. Right now we get we get a, a, a faux uh, a, a cosmic cube, which is, you know, it's kind of fun to see. We don't know it's fake yet. It's sort of a Pier 1 version of... <laughs> uh, the Pier 1 version. It's very much a Pier 1 cube. Not yet cosmic. <laughs> right. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. So this is interesting. So we have this character, Johann Schmidt. I, I'm i not sure. In comic lore, do you know at what point, uh, or was there a point in comic lore where Johann Schmidt became the name for the, the person who became Red Skull? Is that something you're familiar with? 
That I don't know. It's um, definitely not in the 60s. He didn't really have an alter ego at all, and they didn't really dive into his backstory all that much. He was just the big scary guy. And uh, so that's probably much later. I'd imagine, if I had to guess, probably maybe... Steve Englehart in the seventies did something with that or, or after even Roger Stern after that. But I, I should have looked that up. I don't know. Well, I, I just know that the very first time that we see um, uh, Red Skull, it is somebody named George Maxson, who is an industrialist, I believe. And yeah, it was a decoy. Yeah. And is a decoy. Right. And that was the whole thing is that you find out, Oh no, there's somebody else. But then, and I mean, I'm just looking right now, it looks like there were a number of other names that, um, you know that he had gone by over the years but i'm i'm not exactly sure when specifically he became um johann schmidt but um but that's that is the name that we meet here and also the other interesting thing and i'm i'm curious about um your history with the character is mask or no mask because in the comics i mean it even seems like the red skull that we meet at you know as we kind of get his backstory uh, the the red skull is a mask that he wears along with his kind of nazi uniform as a way to kind of symbolize the ultimate evil and everything i i believe like when you get to like um was it captain america first vengeance was the kind of um the comic series that kind of tied into the movie that he had gone through those experiments by Erskine, and and that was a whole thing that kind of led to that. But it seems like in the early days, it was, really was a mask. Is that uh, was there a point that you know about where it made that shift? Yeah, I mean, I'm not aware of that either. To me, he's always just been the disfigured person, and uh, his origin has been kind of rewritten and retconned a few times over the years. So it's hard to say. I don't even know what's what's real and what's not. <laughs> <laughs> I know it changes all the time. I feel yep. like they're always let's do this this time. Let's go that route. Yeah. Well, okay. So Hugo Weaving is playing Johann Schmidt. We like to do this thing on the show uh, where we do the IMDb game with these uh, with these actors. And what the IMDb game is. So as long as neither of you are looking at your IMDb page, I ask you what are the four films that the IMDb algorithm says that this particular actor is known for. <laughs> so if the two of you had to guess, what would you say are the four films that Hugo Weaving has listed as his films that he's known for? Any ideas? Oh, this is easy. This is simple. Okay. Do, do you want me to go first? <laughs> sure. What? Yeah, um, go ahead. I bet it's... Okay, so hold on. Are all the Marvel movies counted as one? Because... No, every single no. movie is its own. No. Yeah. Oh, I guess no. Red Skull wasn't Hugo Weaving in that other one. Okay, so hold on a second. It's The Matrix. It's Lord of the Rings. And it's V for Vendetta, and and this one, and Captain America. Yeah, Pete, what would you say? I I would I would say the Matrix, but probably I don't know which one. Was it Reloaded with the big fight? Uh, the many many Hugo yeah. Weaving oh, fight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was Reloaded. Uh, I'll go with Reloaded. Uh, definitely uh, Lord of the <laughs> Lord of the Rings. But which one? How do you even? How do you even pick? <laughs> um, uh, I'll say. Well, I was I just assumed Fellowship. I would assume the first one of the franchise. I'm going to I'm going to go big and I'm, I'll agree with you V for Vendetta. I'll say The Matrix Reloaded and the first two Lord of the Rings. Oh, OK. Oh, OK. All I'm right. Heavy up on Lord of the Rings. What do we think? Am I close? Well, what's interesting is it's actually uh, all three Lord of the Rings films, <laughs> which is <laughs> oh, no. a real surprise because I wouldn't <laughs> pick him as somebody that really stands out as a prominent role in the films but in in the order they appear it's the lord of the rings the return of the king in the number one slot then I fellowship at number one. two i know and then fellowship's number two v for vendetta is number three and the two towers is number four <laughs> why is the <laughs> matrix not on here i have no idea such oh, a strange man. little run these imdb's never actually seen the matrix it's only just <laughs> they just heard it existed that must be what happened the, or the or the IMDb is becoming the Matrix. Yeah, right. right. They're just trying to <laughs> wave off. <laughs> you don't even know about this part. That's right. That's right. I wonder if awards and accolades um, factors into their algorithm because Return of the King that's is an Oscar yeah. winner, right? And the other ones are not. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's that's and that's the thing that like people are always wondering. Like, does it have to do with their particular like their accolades, the film's accolades, the money it made? And it, it's, it's, I don't know, it's a peculiar thing. So <laughs> fun game though. There wow. it is. 
There it is. I know. Are we going to play that game with the other guy? We did that with David Bradley last week oh, okay, when he first okay. appeared. Yeah, with our Tower Good. Keeper. Uh, I like to call him Tower Keeper Filch. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, right. Yeah, I come up with it. I'm sure it was all Harry Potter that was on his list, right? Uh, there, uh, those and the uh, some of the films from uh, Edgar Wright. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we also have our Hydra Lieutenant here. This is Peter Stark. He was the one last week who was trying to rush the, the infantrymen to get the sarcophagus open, although they failed. And, and here we, and then we have, there are seven other infantrymen, um, running around the room too. So I, I don't know who any of these people are. Very difficult to pinpoint these background actors. Of course, Yawn is still squished under the rocks here and we have the dead Nordic King. So that's the group of people we have here. This scene starts off with Schmidt walking in, very menacing. And um, he, what's what's great is, you know, there's this brief conversation with his lieutenant before this about trying to get the sarcophagus open. Schmidt doesn't seem to care at all. Uh, and what's great about this is we get a sense as to how strong he is. And um, that was a bit of a surprise. What did you two think of this reveal that Schmidt has uh, seems to have incredible strength? I, you know, I didn't even register to me that, that he had, I, I, I didn't even think about that. But now that you mention it, yeah, that's a huge stone slab. Sure. Yeah. And that we have these two guys who have been like muscling at it for, you know, who knows how long. Right. I mean, they're the they were trying to push it and not making a dent. Um, I I did. I guess I did think it was interesting. But now, of course, you know, you've lived with it for so long. It's it's hard to remember that first reaction. But it is uh, it, it is a, a, a thing. If you bring any baggage to Captain America, it is the super soldier baggage. And so here we're setting up our great villain yep. as the super antithesis of whoever we're about to meet. I guess it makes sense. You've already mentioned that series, the comic series, First Vengeance, that ties in here. So we, I mean, if you've read that, you know that he has tried these experiments on himself. So something has stuck for sure. Yeah. And we'll see that come play out later on in the movie, too. Exactly. Exactly. When we have some flashbacks. It's interesting because I don't recall like in the comics beforehand, I, I haven't read a lot of Captain America or Red Skull, but I, I never remember seeing that he had been like a there had been that treatment of super soldier serum. Even in, I think, the the Red Skull incarnate that limited like five um, five episodes, six episode story about uh, Red Skull and his backstory, which is a really interesting comic. But I, I don't think that was even in there. Um, but certainly, you get a sense of how evil he is, and that was that's great to kind of read just for that. So, it's, so yeah, he's super strong, and that's I think an interesting thing to learn about this particular character as he just so um, easily shoves the lid off the sarcophagus. Um, this this seems really though about you know we have Schmidt here talking completely with the tower keeper david bradley's character what do we think of of hugo weaving in this role any thoughts on on his performance here and i I suppose we're just calling him schmidt we're not going to bother calling him red skull until that reveal but uh thoughts on on weaving i i couldn't it took me a while to decide whether i liked his approach to the german accent (laughs) <laughs> the the authoritarian german uh treatment and uh i you know i i i feel like i have some german language in my in my background and uh and it didn't sound like my grandmother you know what i mean like it didn't it didn't sound familiar but it sure, certainly sounds diabolical and i eventually i found it fun i i like the i like the approach that he takes to it um i hugo weaving is it's hard for me to find fault in just about anything that he has done. I I very much like this guy. And uh, he seems like he's getting a lot of delight out of playing this character. Um, he, he reminds me, he's, he's sort of in that class of performer like Alan Rickman. Like, they just whether they're playing, you know, evildoers or romantic leads or whatever, I, they can't really do wrong for me. They're just in that in that space. He has a commanding presence just as soon as he enters that room. He doesn't have to do anything. Just standing there, he conveys this sense of power. It's interesting to see how Marvel movies have changed over the years. Of course, this one is now, uh, what year did this one come out? 2010 or something like that? 11? 11. Mm -hmm. So it's over 10 years old. Uh, Nowadays, if this movie were made today, they would all be speaking German and we'd have English subtitles. Really interesting observation. Yeah. Yeah. Because right now they are in 
um, Austria, right? No, no, Nor- Nor- Norway. Norway. They're in yeah, Norway. 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 Um, all of these soldiers wouldn't be speaking English to each other. There's not a chance. And uh, now that right. we've been past Black Panther and we've been past, Shang- past uh, Shang-Chi, where we have whole scenes where it's done in their native language, uh, this one seems out of place because of it. Uh, really, it's like Hugo weaving with a German accent sound. It's, it's kind of corny. Uh, <laughs> if he were speaking German, and if everyone was speaking German, and then when he was speaking to Captain America, he put on his his German accent, that would make more sense that we were like, okay, this is kind of a weird accent because he's trying to speak English. It's not, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not his first language. And and that does make sense when he turns to David Bradley uh, that he is speaking English. And, and I guess that's the point uh, that that's one point. But you're right about the soldiers. The the whole texture of the of the scene would have changed, uh, I, I, I think, as a result of 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 that. We would not hear soldiers speaking English to each other. Yeah. And in fact, the tower keeper should probably be speaking some Nordic Norwegian. language or something Norwegian. Yeah. Well, and and he and and Jan were speaking. Um, uh, I I'm, we're presuming it was Norwegian last week um, when they when Jan first runs in and they have a brief conversation. Uh, but yeah, from from this point on, it's all it's all English. And uh, to your point, Pete, it, it could make sense for them to be speaking English here because neither of them might speak the same language. But you're right. I mean, they should be speaking German strictly. Uh, with but each other. Here's my, I, I, is it David? Forgive my ear now that we're talking about it. All I hear is filch. Is David Bradley even <laughs> attempting to speak in a non sort of British English so. accent? I don't think <laughs> so. so. We have Schmidt showing up with this German accent and David Bradley is a is speaking, we assume, some sort of Nordic language with a perfect British accent for English. You're right. It all falls apart. It's yeah. a Jenga tower of language and cultural appropriation. <laughs> what, what's interesting, and I I can almost see them making the decision to to keep it in the the English with a German accent way of doing it because that is very much how the comics were written right they would when the germans were speaking it was v half you now you know they were very yeah. much spelling it <laughs> yeah. uh, phonetically for the words yeah. and so i guess maybe it can fit there but still i, I mean to your point it does make more sense in t- through today's eyes for them to have just had them speaking german with each other what this does is it makes this scene feel very raiders of the lost ark in that sense, yeah. because you have the same thing. It's like, this is something that we did, you know, in the 80s. Yeah. But nowadays, we are actually, you know, a lot more authentic with uh, with our with our films in that sense. It, I think there's an element of Joe Johnston being the director where having it feel like Raiders might make mm-hmm. sense, you know, yep. because he seems like that sort of director. He's He's from that pool of filmmakers. There's an element there that I think it, it feels like if he was going to make a film in the Marvel Universe, <laughs> his is the one that would have the Germans talking this way. Yes, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> diabolical, diabolical, That's underline, right. highlight, diabolical. What, one other thing I love here is you have this inevitable comparison from the bad guy that's essentially the we're two sides of the same coin comparison, which, um, you know, so many bad. I mean, even in Raiders, you have that <laughs> when uh, when Belloc says that to to Indy, where they have that whole thing about, you know, we're both the same. And, and it's interesting that he is bringing it up to the tower keeper here about how it, it's this passion they both have for this thing that might be a little more than science. It's an interesting kind of um, approach to take with this this person, this thing that's beyond science, but it's um, not superstition. It's, you know, something more. I, I don't know. I, what did you two think of kind of that, the way that we approach this conversation between these two? There's a sense that this, this whole we're the same, you and I, is it, it always comes out as a rationalization from the bad guy, right? We're the same, <laughs> you and I. I'm not as bad as you think because I'm a scientist, philosopher, fill in the blank, mad lib of of what I'm, what you are, um, to justify the evil deeds that I will be doing, no doubt. And um, in this case, obviously, it doesn't fly. He's the evil doer. He's the guy who's been killing people and knocking over buildings with his giant tank. Um, but it does set the stage that he believes that his mission, whatever that mission is, we have yet to find out, is as big as 
uh, Filch's <laughs> Filch's mission <laughs> to protect this thing that he's trying to get right. Like those two things are moral equivalents, and we sort of have to set the stage that way to understand just how important that thing is to the narrative arc of the rest of the film. And I feel like this is also playing into the Nazi aspect of Red Skull because they were all about saying, you know, we like all just the propaganda of convincing people that they were the the master race and they were right and what they were doing is correct. And like that's speaking those half truths is just kind of that's that's how they did things. Yeah. It also sets up a conversation, I think, that that doesn't ultimately get get filled out. But the the act of setting up a a a power relationship that if you are a ultimately want to be seen in the eyes in the favorable eyes of the Reich, you will be a good Nazi, right? You will do what we need to do here. You will stop the shenanigans of hiding things, right? And that's ultimately a lot of the conversation that we end up having through the rest of the movie. I'm excited to get there about those who are allegiant to uh, the burgeoning Hydra and those who ultimately are not. There's definitely a lot here about kind of uh, about that, and uh, I mean, even there's an aspect here. You could almost say that Schmidt is in some way trying to appeal. And that's the whole point of these, you know, we're two sides of the same coin conversations is trying to appeal to the sense that we can see better than what everyone else can. You should join me because this can help us both out. That's kind of the intent of the conversation. Of course, you know, the tower keeper sees right through that and uh, isn't going to help him out at all. And then we do get the big reveal of this uh this thing the last time we saw this uh the tesseract it was at the end of thor in the uh post credits sequence in the the bowels of some mystery building with uh fury and and eric selvig as we see this this case that they're looking at and of course loki is there as well this certainly doesn't look the same when you when you both saw this did you think that this was that or were you on to the story and you knew exactly what was happening uh, that this necess- wasn't necessarily real. I'm pretty sure it was Pier 1. I'm going <laughs> to lean in on the Pier 1 joke. I'm pretty sure when I first saw it, it was Pier 1. It's it's a glass bauble. Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that I didn't know at the time. It's hard to say this was 11 years ago, but I think I'm pretty sure I was surprised because we just didn't know how it, the Tesseract would act at this point. Like having only seen it for a split second. Yeah, sure, it was glowing in the other time, but... Like, does it glow when you power it on or like, you know, do you have to turn it on its side to make it glow or you know, there, it, it could have been anything. So and this was just uh, the introduction, really. But it's a good MacGuffin. It is, it's a great MacGuffin. It feels very Raiders also. You know, the idea that it's in the hands of a of a uh, kind of a mummy in this sarcophagus, this old Nordic <laughs> king. An old knight, <laughs> totally. Yeah, right. Yeah. I love the... I mean, that yeah. right there is enough to kind of just make me excited about how they chose to place it. You know, I thought that was kind of cool. It does It does feel homage but, you know, speaking to the point about a, a, as great of a MacGuffin as it is... Um, and and I this is speaking a little bit to the second minute, so I'll, we can you know table this. But at this point, at this minute, it feels like the setup to this MacGuffin joke that is going to play out. Like like maybe the the search is on for this thing, and, and maybe the joke doesn't get extended quite a, a, quite uh, long enough. Um, I I feel myself wanting more uh, in this in this next minute, so we'll table that. But yeah, do you know um, uh, when the I mean when we first find this in the comics back in Tale of Suspense number seventy nine, it's just called a cosmic cube. That's generally what it's called for quite a while. I'm not sure what the point was where they changed the name of it to the Tesseract, or if that was something that was specific in the films. It was specific to the films. It is. Okay. Yeah. They changed it in the comics. Like a lot of things they changed in the comics once the movie makes them popular. Retroactively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the name, you know, Tesseract is uh, something I had always associated with. um, Oh, Swiftly Tilting uh, Planet, Wind of the Door, uh, Wrinkle in Time. Wrinkle in Time. I'm I'm not a fan. (laughs) 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 I'm just read off all of the books. I'm just going to do them all. all. Hold on. That's awesome. That's that's always where I first heard of Tesseract, and um, which is kind of like a, a cube thing. 
Meg is sitting at the kitchen table and she has this, she's st- talking with the witch and she has the string and she says they're folding and they fold the string and you go from, come on, man, do the work, do the research. You've got it. You've got it. No, so why do I need to when you've got it all? A, a tesseract is a, is a four dimensional cube. It's like a cube is three dimensional. A tesseract is the four dimensional version of a cube. And um, if you, if you think about when you cut open a cube and you know how you have like those fold out ones, you can cut it open. And it looks like kind of like a T like it has the six cubes or the six squares. So you unfold a three dimensional cube and you have six two dimensional squares. If you unfold a tesseract the same way, the four dimensional tesseract, you have eight three dimensional cubes. And so these eight three dimensional cubes, they're they fold into each other and they become a tesseract. And that's what that is. And I love that it's an actual like moving through space tool because that's kind of what the tesseract is, is, is it, it has these um, hypersurfaces that, that, um, that fold and bend, bend to space. That was a real smart answer. It's much smarter than, than, I know. than the somebody, book. Somebody, that was a re- somebody, somebody did, did actually research. did the research. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think it's interesting. I mean, obviously, they retroactively decided that, hey, let's make this the uh, the space stone. But it makes sense. Like when you think about like the kind of how you just described the tesseract and and what what it ends up representing, I think there's an interesting element of that in in the way that it uh, is designed to work. Absolutely. Uh, Let's see, what else? Any other thoughts on this one? We talked about uh, Red Skull. Uh, We've got, of course, the reveal here at the end. Any other thoughts on anything within this minute? You know, we already talked about just sort of the destruction of the building and the the tank doesn't move yet. Uh, really, we just end on Schmidt saying the Tesseract as it, <laughs> and really that as far as we know, that's the end of the sentence. He's just aware that he is holding a Tesseract and it's very exciting for him. Right, right, right. Curtis, any other any other notes from this minute? No, I think we've hit all of the highlights here. My only other note that I wanted to bring up is there are Hydra logos everywhere like so many hydro logos on his hat he's (laughs) got his hat which also has the swastika he's got a a little lapel pin his buttons have the hydro logo i'm sure as we go through this film we're going to see hydro logos popping up all over the place i'm actually glad you say that andy because hydra ostensibly is a secret organization eventually and at this point (laughs) it's still the nazi like super super advanced science initiative so at some point they have to take this thing that's not a secret and make it a secret again and i think that's a rebranding effort that might be uh now a little bit dubious i'm (laughs) <laughs> I, this may end up being problematic for me. Let's see. You, you'd think, I mean, you'd think that in museums down the road, there would end up being yeah. like, oh, this is an outfit from the Hydra officers who had <laughs> been a part of this. all of Schmidt's stuff is there. <laughs> his car. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Will it, does his car end up surviving? I don't think so. I don't know. Um, you know, I did have one more thing I did want to bring up. We, last week in our conversation, we didn't give the dates for any of the time that we spent in the Arctic. Uh, just to clarify, because I know we've always been doing the meanwhile in the MCU with all of this. Yeah. So the Russian oil team discovers the crashed Valkyrie on October 5th, 2011. 18 hours later, the S.H.I.E.L.D. agents are, are dispatched to the area. So that's October 6th. And then everything else happens within a few days, like including like, uh, Steve's thawing, which we'll talk about when we get to the end of the movie. Just as a reminder, Fury rec- recruits Eric Selvig at the end of Thor, and that's June seventh, two thousand ten. So all of this uh, story is taking place about sixteen months after our last foray into the MCU. Okay, and um, we'll talk about the Tesseract's journey probably um, later in the course of the film. And then, as far as today, this is March ninth, nineteen forty-two. Just so we are aware of the date, so. Excellent. Awesome. All right. Well, um, Curtis, uh, remind everybody again about your podcast and where they can find uh, find it and learn more about it. Sure. Yeah. Head over to EpicMarvelPodcast.com where you can search me up on uh, any social media. I'm there. Just look for Epic Marvel Podcast. Epic Marvel Podcast. Fantastic. It's a fun one. Check it out. And uh, as a reminder, you can join our conversation over in our Discord community. We'd love to have you. Just go to truestory.fm slash Marvel Movie Minute, and you can click on the Discord link and join us there. That's it. We'll be back tomorrow uh, with another minute. So until next time, true believers. 
I could do this all day. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is Spread the News by Anthony Vega, and this season's show art is by Winston Yabo. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show. <laughs>